Heavenly Father, we thank you. We give you the praise. We exalt your holy name. We thank you for all that you are to us. We thank you for all that you are doing in our lives. Lord, we say that we are grateful. Lord, we say that we are grateful. Thank you for your manifold love that you have bestowed upon us. The Bible says, oh, what manner of love that the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Thank you for your love. Thank you for proving again and again and again in our lives that your word is true. Thank you for proving again and again that your word is trustworthy. Thank you for proving again and again that your word is yes and amen. Thank you for proving again and again that your word is faithful. Oh, Jesus, we thank you. We have come to say that we love you. We have come to say that we adore you. Thank you for beautifying our lives. Thank you for all that you represent and all that you do. Thank you for being our God, our Savior, and our Master. We have come to say today again that we enjoy your Lordship. We have come again to say today that we enjoy your rulership. We have come again to say that we enjoy your leadership over our lives. We surrender to you again and again. We surrender, we submit to you again and again. We ask that by your spirit, we ask that by your power, you bring us to all that you propose for us. We ask, Father, that all that you desire for us by your spirit, even as we look into your word today, once again, you will do more with our lives. Once again, by your spirit, you will add another layer of what you are building in our lives. Today, again, you will add another building block Today again, you add another dimension, another beauty to our lives by your word. You will transform us again. You will show us Jesus. You will take of him and reveal to us in the end that we should praise you. In the end, we will adore you. At the end of today's teaching, we want to know, we want to be sure. It has to be obvious that we have touched your power, that we have touched your grace, that we have touched your truth. And of the truth, indeed, your truth has sanctified us and your truth has changed us. Thank you, Father, for answering our prayers. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So you are welcome once again to SGS Teachings. Uh, last week, I was supposed to be able to speak to you, but for one reason or the other, I wasn't able to uh, be here in person. Meanwhile, I sent my word, and uh, I believe that uh, the message was clearly delivered. Uh, myself, I was listening again, vessels unto honor, and uh, it blessed me uh, tremendously. And I believe that you were blessed for those of us who have been following. Uh, quickly, I will say that if you are listening to today's teaching, you may want to invite somebody or share with someone because today's teaching is uh, it's a very powerful one and I believe that your life will not remain the same in Jesus name Amen <clears throat> so we're looking at Matthew chapter 5 and uh, we studied the Beatitudes we talked about the source of the earth, we talked about the light of the world, we talked about uh, Jesus coming to fulfill the law and not to destroy it, we talked about Jesus talking about the need to do rather than teach. Then, of course, we talked about how Jesus said, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, you will not enter God's kingdom. And then he made that statement and then began to uh, show us the things the Pharisees taught, the scribes and the Pharisees, they have the things they teach in the synagogues. Now Jesus came and said, come on, I am carrying you to a whole new level. 
I just told you about an exceeding obedience. So for you to have exceeding obedience, you have to have exceeding instructions because if you are bounded by the limitations of the instructions you have, then you will never be able to surpass the Pharisees in the level of their righteousness. Now, there is more to surpassing this righteousness than instructions, all right? But you know, Jesus was... The gospel that Jesus preached is not the same as the gospel that we hear later on in the later parts of the New Testament. So Jesus was the New Testament man preaching to an Old Testament people the principles of the New Testament. So sometimes it stays, it tries to, you know, take them from where they are to where he wants them to be. So he has told them that your righteousness must surpass that of the Pharisees. And the first thing he brings to them is one area, one dimension of that surpassing, that surpassing righteousness is that there must be a surpassing instruction. Now, we live in a day and age where believers do not want to hear about the surpassing instructions. I am sure when some people see the topic God's superior grace, they might be thinking, oh, we have come to tell you about the elementary again, the elementary of that your sins are forgiven, that Jesus, God will no longer impute your sin to you, which is important. That is your state. That is your identity in Christ. That is who you are. That is what you have. But who you are and what you have must begin to reflect in how much of God's surpassing and superior instruction you are able to uh, prosecute. Hallelujah. How are you following? So there is, it, is, it is one thing to have to be somebody. It is one thing to have privileges. It is one thing to have treasures. So I am a child of God. My God is my father. He is my God. He loves me. He has given me all that pertains to life and godliness. He will provide for me. He will not impute my sin to my child. He has forgiven my sins. He has cleansed me from all iniquity. I live in his house forever. These are realities of who you are. But you see, everything God has given to you, everything that God has made you, is to the end that you may be able to begin to do. Hallelujah. Every manufacturer creates, you know, when you manufacture something, a, a, a car owner, a, a car manufacturer, for example, manufactures a car and puts in beautiful, beautiful furnishing, puts in different kinds of uh, uh, above the chart technology, you know, for it to be beautiful. And people see the car, wow, see a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful car. But the whole purpose of the beauty in that car is so that it can serve somebody. There is a service, there is a service that the car is meant to serve. The beauty is to an end. The beauty is to an end. The beauty is not just so you can brandish, I have a, uh, uh, I made a beautiful car, or the car is beautiful. If the end of that car is not met, no matter how beautiful it is, it has not uh, fulfilled its purpose. So all that God has done for us in Jesus, the foundation that has been laid, the beauty, everything that God has done for us, he wants to begin to see that the investment he has made in us is yielding results. Oh, the first Adam was a living soul. The last Adam is a life-giving spirit. Okay, okay. Life-giving spirits. If you are a life-giving spirit, then begin to give the life. Give the life. Hallelujah. So, God's surpassing grace brings to us not only um, 
God surpassing benefits, God surpassing privileges, God surpassing treasures, it also brings to us God surpassing instruction. So the instruction of grace, they are way higher than the instruction of the law. So like I said last, the last time we spoke here, that you will never see Jesus preach, thou shalt not kill. He said, you guys should know that already. You have been told, you have heard it from the Pharisees, that thou shalt not murder. But I say unto you, I say unto you, don't expect that I should tell you not to murder. No, 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 no. Because my investment in your life already does not prove, it cannot even make murder becomes one of your contemplation. It is not your temptation. How do you follow it? Thou shalt not murder. It's not, it's not, should not be a temptation for a child of God. It can be a temptation for a non-believer. Well, if you have Jesus inside you, God, Jesus said, see, as far as this life is concerned, we can talk about other things, but murder is not one of it. Hallelujah. So he said, you have heard. The Pharisees taught you, the scribes taught you that you should not kill. And that anybody who kills will be judged. He said, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother, the kind of punishment a murderer deserves is what is meted to him. Hey, Kakai. Come on. Come on. You can imagine that. Grace, the grace of God is beautiful. The grace of God is sweet. Yes, it is. But you must come to this level of grace too. You must come to the responsibility grace, not the babyish grace. There is a baby level grace. If I pull in my pants, my father will not beat me. If I wee on the floor, my mother will clean it. I will never be scolded. My father never scolds me. See the baby, this is a, a three months year old thinking, a three months old baby thinking. Even if I throw tantrum and cry all through the night and disturb the neighborhood, my, my mom will not flog me for once. It won't evoke me. In fact, the more tantrum I am throwing, the more my mom is still petting me and still, you know, begging me and still trying to feed me. Oh, my mom loves me so much. Yes. 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 He, she loves you so much. And see, oh, the last time I peed in my pants, I, in fact, I pulled on the floor. My mom still went there and still packed it. What a very loving mom. Ah, very sweet mom. Yeah, beautiful. Do you know that I don't do anything in the house? I never sweep the floor. I never wash the plate. I don't need to do anything. I only wake up, I eat all through the day and sleep. <laughs> and then when I wake up, I resume again. I sleep, I eat, I cry. I don't, I don't have any other business. I, I don't bat myself. My mom bats me, you know. And everything is about how beautiful, how much loving my parents are. Yes, it's allowed as long as you are a baby. But no parent wants to continue doing that for a child of three years old, a child of five years old, a child of ten years old. If a child of ten years old is still making that same statement, and that is why there has to be some form of uh, balance between the two sides. Balance. The balance between those who are so who major so much on what God has done, and those who major so much on what they have to do. There are two sides of a coin that cannot be separated. It is the mystery between grace and faith. Hallelujah. So the grace of God is that has come, that, that beautiful grace, that abundant grace, it comes with some level of responsibility. 
a child. A child of a son. So Jesus said, if people out there, you are, you are my son, and I told you that one of the signs that you are a member of this kingdom is that you manifest a level of righteousness that is higher than that of the Pharisees and the scribes. So you see, as a father and as a God, if I go out there and I see somebody murder somebody because I am the judge, I will ensure that person is due, is fully punished. The full weight of the punishment of a mother that that person will get. Say, but you that you are my children. Kai, if you are angry with your brother, you see the same kind of punishment I give to those who kill somebody, that's what I will mix to you. You see that? For those who are outside, they can peddle the matters of killing. Now, like I said last week, <laughs> it will be preposterous to even contemplate the possibility that a child of God will take a life. And I was very strong on those who commit abortion the last time. Very strong. You saw those children, they, will, they are never waiting for you. <laughs> I pray that you get there. <laughs> You'll be surprised. Because they are living people. They are real people. So it will be an aberration to even contemplate the possibility that a child of God will take a life. So there is no punishment. <laughs> there is no punishment that is covered for a child of God to kill because it is, we don't even look in that direction at all. You know, there's somewhere in the book of Amos or O.C. I read about, I think it's Amos, where God said, you guys committed sins that I never imagined you could commit. So I didn't write it in my law that anybody who, there is no policy for this kind of sin. <laughs> can go and find it. He said, you people, you made your children to go through fire. I said, it was never, if I had imagined that you could have done it, <laughs> probably, I would have added it to the laws that Anybody who makes a child to pass through fire, this and this will happen to him. Say, but it never crossed my mind that you could do that. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So Jesus said, if people outside should murder, I will make sure they face the judgment and they receive their just recompense. But for you who are my children, for you who are my children, when you are angry with your brother, when you are angry with your brother without a cause, and I began to explain the meaning of that cause last week, the last time I met. When you are angry with your brother without a cause, he said, the exact judgment of a murderer, that's what I'll give to you. That is strange. Welcome to the New Testament. Welcome. You don't play here. I will treat you the way I will treat a mother. James. James chapter. Is it James now? No, not James. That should be. Um, I think it's first John 3:15. First John three fifteen. You see, he said, "Whosoever hates his brother is a murderer." You see that? You see that? Whosoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So, in case you think I am just unduly magnifying what Jesus said. The apostle James said, <laughs> so that by two immutable, immutable things that it is impossible for God to lie. See it here. That that kind of hatred you have towards somebody that flows out with anger and wrath. He says, whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. In this kingdom, we consider hatred anger equal to murder. 
And some of you have never contemplated this. You have never committed it to, mind, to the mind. Hallelujah. And there is so much abuse. And one of, one, of, one of the matters most misunderstood by believers is the matter of anger. That many believers have failed to go to God in prayer that this anger, remove it. Because they do not understand the gravity of that sin. When you begin to see it as murder, you begin to rethink that evil attitude, that evil belief, that plague, that plague that you called and have it. But that is how we are in our family. That plague, we cry out to God for salvation. Because every time you manifest this kind of anger, God sees the mother. So when you understand how grievous it is, the next time you go to God in prayers, you will not be worried about the car you are unable to buy or the food on your table. This cancer in your body that makes you look like a murderer before your God, you will go to God in prayer about as a father, remove this thing, remove this cancer, remove this evil thing from my life. All right, let's go to Ephesians chapter Chapter 4. Let's go to and check that scripture that has, I don't know, the best way to put it. Ephesians 4.26. We are coming back to Matthew uh, 5.22. There are a number of things we want to look at, but I hope that we'll be able to deal with this matter. What we are looking at is that, what we are looking at now is that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in the danger of the judgment. Now, see what he said before. Thou, you have heard that thou shalt not kill. Whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Take note. Anybody who kills will be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. So the same punishment that we give to a murderer is what we give to anger. Now, you can't find Moses or any, any, any prophet before Jesus preaching this. No, no, no. No. You won't find it. This one is only for those who are members of his kingdom. It's for them. Now, let's go to Ephesians 4, verse 26. This scripture that has puzzled the mind of many people and has, uh, what's the way now? Has given license to anger. That's how to put it. People have taken this scripture and licensed their anger. Ephesians 4.26 The Bible says, Be ye hungry. The same Bible that said, Be ye holy. The Bible says, Be ye angry. And sin not. Let not the sun Go down upon your rot. Whoa. Whoa. Heavy words. The instruction says, Be ye angry and sin not. Do not allow. See, this kind of anger is a very strong one because later on it causes anger a form of rot. Now it says, do not let the sun set. Don't allow the sun to go down on your rot. Now, when people get angry and you are trying to correct them, one of the scriptures, one of the cards they quickly play is, but the Bible says, be angry and sin not. In fact, because of this scripture, a number of persons have believed that they have the right to be angry. They believe that they have the, they are entitled to be angry. They are entitled to lose their temper. And it does not matter whether they are, in fact, it doesn't matter whether they are a man of God or not. The, this scripture has licensed a lot of anger use. License. So every time they think 
every time they imagine getting angry and they want to put themselves in order, when they remember this scripture, they say, wow, the Bible says, so I will get angry today. Now, as if that is not enough, <laughs> then they say, let not the song go down on your anger. So if they get angry in the morning, for example, they feel that they are entitled to be angry all through the day. But as their song begins to set, they will make sure they deal with whatever it is that's making them angry. Because the Bible says, be angry and sin not. Don't allow the sun to set on your anger. So if I'm angry with my wife or my husband all through the day, I must make sure we set it before we sleep. There are homes that operate by their rule. I, it, well, it, it, it helps them. It helps a few of them. But that doesn't make it right. That doesn't make it right. I'm, I, I'm sure it helps, you know, at least. Whatever it is that is causing the issue, you will not extend to the next day. At least. But that's not scriptural. <laughs> I'll allow it. That's what I want to show you now. That is what I want to show you now. Now, before I begin to explain what that scripture means, let's go to verse 31 because if you don't read scripture in context, Bible study always must be done in context. You can't just pick out a scripture and use it the way you want without looking at context. Verse 31. So what verse 31 says. Now, remember, remember that the, the first instruction is be ye angry, right? And sin not, right? Let not the sun go down upon your rot. So it means you have a rot. So the Bible here agrees that you have a rot and that the sun should not set on that rot. So it means that you are entitled to that rot. I am not frowning at your rot. I am not frowning at your anger, but I'm saying two things. Okay, I'm saying one thing. Number one, I'm saying be angry, but I'm saying don't allow, then don't sin. Then I'm saying don't allow the sun to go down on your rot. So what an average Christian believes now is that I am entitled to have rot. I am entitled to, when we're young, they told us, Anger is one minute madness. <laughs> I am entitled to go gaga. I am entitled to, to lose my temper. I am entitled to act like a devil or act like a madman. But I must make sure that whatever it is that is making me lose my temper must be sorted before nightfall. I am entitled to my anger. I am entitled to my wrath. But then it should not go past tonight. Now let's see what verse 1 says. Ephesians 4.31 Let all bitterness and rot and rot and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. You see that? Did you find about two matters in that scriptures? The first matter is anger. The second matter is rot. But that's when this is told us that you have rot. But you are entitled, according to your explanation, your explanation says you are entitled to keep the rot until nightfall. But now, verse 31 says, let all bitterness, all, and every rot, and every anger, and every clamor, and every evil speaking be put away from you. It means you are not meant to have it at all. Evil speaking. Evil speaking. You should not have it at all. You should not have anger. You should not have bitterness. You should not have rot. You should not have clamor. All these things are there. All of them work together. 
Most times, anger, bitterness leads to malice. Uh, malice leads to anger, leads to wrath, leads to evil speaking, leads, leads to clamor. And so everything in this verse 31, they are all about how people relate with one another. Because you read the next verse, it says, But be ye kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgive one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us. It went on and on and on like that. But then what we are bringing out today is that put away every anger and every wrath from you. So if God is telling us to put away anger and wrath, why then did he tell us in verse 26 to be angry? And sin not. And not allow the sun to set on our anger. See, one of the problems, one of the things that should juggle your mind, one of the things that should, um, that should make you think is that uh, what if, because most people think that, like I said, you, are, you, you get angry in the morning, you set to it by night. But what if the anger begins at night? What if? What if the anger begins at midnight or at sunset, maybe around 6 p.m. or 8 p.m. or 7 p.m.? So do I have to wait for the sun to rise on the anger? Then wait till the sun now set on the anger <laughs> before I now set to it. Come on. Come on. So that should show you that something is not right. Something is not right. The Bible says that anger rests in the bosom of fools. In the bosom of fools. So the mere fact that you allow anger to rest in your mind, the Bible says that you're already a fool. Meanwhile, you say the Bible says, I, if I get angry in the morning, in the morning, 8 a.m., I am entitled to keep that anger red hot. Let it become wrought and let me carry it in night, when it is around 8 or 9 p.m. I can let it go. And the same Bible says, Put away every evil speaking. Just like God will not permit evil speaking in your life for just a moment. Or permit malice for just a moment. Why then will God permit anger for a moment? He said, put it all away. Imagine the anger that destroyed Moses. How long did that anger last? Because you have licensed anger. The anger that destroyed Moses did not last. I'm not sure it lasted more than one hour. One decision made in anger destroyed him forever. It didn't need to. <laughs> it didn't even have one hour or two hours to deal with the anger. When he killed somebody, what caused the killing? Same anger, same rot. Same anger kill. He made him kill somebody. The same anger made him to strike the rock rather than stretch his rod to the rock. The same anger ensured that he never touched the promised land. Now, this anger, how long did the anger take? Did it take two hours or three hours? Did he have time? Was God waiting for him till he slammed? And then the following day, God says, Moses, because your anger lasted the whole day, and now you have slept and woken up, and you are still angry, now we punish you. No? Immediately, he made an action in anger. The wrath of God was also hanging on his head. Mr. Man, you have not sanctified me before his strength. And because of this, you're not in the promised land. So when you read this scripture, the next time you read this scripture and you think that God is saying you can get angry throughout the day and by night you can let go of the anger, you better think twice. Because one minute of anger is enough to make an indelible mark on your life. One minute. One minute. I hope that you know that there are countries, all countries in the world, places on earth where the sun does not set for days at a time. Like no sunset. I think Norway and some parts of Canada and some other places around the Arctic, because of where they are on the planet, 
They don't experience sunset for days. I mean, the sun will be up in the sky <laughs> around the clock. Around the clock. Around the clock, the sun is up. For 70 straight days, I think in Norway, there is no sunset. So if a man in Norway is reading this scripture, Kai. <laughs> so for two straight months, two straight months, no sunset. Kai, be ye angry. Don't allow the sun to set. And then I think it's around April, there about that this, the, the sunrise begins and it never sets. The April 1st, that was when he got angry. Hiya. The next two months, he will not throw the anger. Say, I must wait till the sun sets before I let this matter go. You know the worst case? There is, they have one full month when the sun does not rise. Now imagine that somebody got angry when the sun did not rise again. <laughs> uh, what, is it, what, is, what would the poor man do? So when we are reading scripture, let's put our minds to it and ask questions. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So you see, God did not want, the Bible says, put all the anger, put it all away. The Bible says the wrath of man, James 1, I think verse 20, will never walk the righteousness of God. We are humans, we are people say that a lot, but we are not just humans. When you hear things like this, one of, one, of the, one of the most careless statements people make. Ah, God's grace will just continue to help us. We are still humans. We are still carrying this flesh. And they use that to pour water on everything they have heard. I know what they mean by that. This is difficult. We cannot do it. The bottom line of all they said, when people say, ah, God, you continue to just give us grace. Oh, we are. We are still, all of us, we are still humans. When you talk like that, you know what you, you have done? You have, you have put a doubt. You have doused your faith. And if you are a child of God, you are not just woman. You are not a Pharisee. You are not an unbeliever. You are not a legalistic person. One third of you is already 100% the temple of the Holy Spirit. In fact, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Because God lives in you. Your spirit is already redeemed. Your spirit is already like Christ. John said, Hi. He said, as he is. As he is. He said, so are we in this world. And by that he meant that our spirit is exactly like Jesus in this world. So you don't say you are just human. You are not just human. One thought of you is world to world Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. So you are not just human. You are a superhuman. And the Bible says that his commandments, they are not grievous. He said, my yoke is easy. My body is light. If he asks you to do anything, you can be sure. That the grace to do it has been supplied. God will never ask you to do something that you don't have capacity to do. And that's one of the reasons why the, 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 the grace is superior to the law. Because grace comes with ability. There are some things God cannot instruct those under the law. I hope you know that the law never said thou shalt not lie. You can go and check. It's not there. Thou shalt not lie, it's not covered within the instruction of the law. The best the law could say is don't be a false witness of your neighbor. That's the, that, is the, <laughs> that is the closest to a lie that you find in the law. But Jesus came and he said, Ye are of your father, the, the, your father, the, the devil. A liar he is from the beginning. He is a father of lies. Everybody who lies, they are his children. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So you see, God's superior grace comes with God's superior instruction and God's superior ability to execute the impossible. Believe that. So the Bible says, put away from you every anger. Put away from you every rot. So let me quickly explain what this is saying and then we we'll go on to talk about Anger, then I, will, then I will create a balance on the matter of anger. If you have time, we look more at that verse, uh, Matthew 5.22, and then we can pray. Hallelujah. I hope you are getting blessed. 
Praise the Lord. So I believe with these few scriptures of mine and my explanations, you are now convinced beyond a doubt that if Ephesians 4 verse 26 is not giving license to anger for the day and no anger in the night. I believe so. With this few arguments of mine, I hope you are are convinced. I hope you are convinced. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, um, hallelujah. Now the Bible says, be ye angry and sin not. Do not allow the sun to go down on your rod. Verse 27 says, neither give place to the devil. So the story of this context is actually instructing you to be angry. All right, I think this will help me to close in what I'm talking about now. The, it is an instruction to be angry. Now, every other scripture tells us not to be angry. But this one says, be angry. But it says, the kind of anger I am instructing you to display is one that is not laced with sin. So he said, be angry and sin not. Now, he now explains more about the kind of anger he's talking about. He's saying that this kind of anger, under no circumstances, should you allow, do not allow, do not allow the sun, the blazing, the fire of your anger to go down. Let me explain. I will really explain. Because the way you're looking at me, I can't see you. <laughs> I can tell I don't get it yet. Now, it's an instruction. If you can read together, you will see. Ephesians 4, 26. Be ye angry. It's an instruction to be angry. Like I said, the same Bible says, be ye holy. It says, be ye angry. Now, so that you understand that this instruction is not carnal, it says that, and say not, do not allow the son of your anger, of your wrath to go down. Next verse says, neither give place to the devil. So the instruction here to be angry is the kind of anger that is displayed against the devil and all his work. And as far as this anger is concerned, God says that you, this kind of anger must be left hot and the sun of this anger must not go down. Don't allow it to go down. Keep it burning. Keep it burning. There are people who have learned how to be angry with their neighbor, but they have not learned how to be angry with the devil. Anger against the devil is a fruit of the spirit. That every child of God should have. In our RISA program, we tell we tell our students to go and find out all that fruit of the spirit that are not covered within the nine. And then, of course, they're able to come up, come up with a number of them, six, seven, eight, that are not covered within that. So one of the fruit of the spirit is what we call spiritual anger. And I can show you an example. One of the most beautiful examples is somewhere in the, in, in, in the law. Hi. Something happened. The Israelites began to sleep with the children of Moab, the Moabites. I think this later on we found out that it was Balaam that set up Balak. Balaam told Balak to set up the children of Israel with strange women. So, Israelites began to sleep with strange women. They began to bring them into the camp, sleep with them, began to defy themselves with strange women, which God commanded them not to do. When that began, a plague struck in the people. People began to die. People began to die. And, you know, people were dying. And people ran to Moses to tell him, people are dying. Please come and save us. That's how they run to you. Save us from this heavy plague. People are dying. Help us. Why Moses was still contemplating on what to do and still thinking. Moses and Aaron and Phineas, the son of Aaron, and others, they were there. Thinking on what to do, what's next, trying to pray. Then one careless <laughs> Israelite carried 
a Moabitish woman and begin to romance the lady in the presence of everybody. Hi! Was romancing them. And there is one man called Phineas. Phineas. The anger of the Lord came upon him. The zeal of the Lord came upon him. And the Bible says he took a javelin in his hand and pinned the man and the woman to the wall. With a javelin. He pinned the both of them together. Angry in his spirit. Pinned them both. Killed them both. Instantly. Hi. And God said, Hi. 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 I can imagine the way God felt that day. Hey. So this, he said, Phineas has truly, he has truly, he has treated this matter the way I would have done if I was there physically. So this man, he had my heart. He had, he had, he was able to do exactly the way I would do if I had a physical body on it. He said, I give him my covenant of peace. Ah, I will bless this guy. I will bless. I will so bless you that you know that God blessed you because you carried my zeal. You carried my fire. You carried my anger. Be ye angry and say not. Do you know that failure to get angry at the things God wants to be angry with can break the heart of God? When God expects you to be angry, if you are being lackadaisical or you are being nonchalant or you are being indifferent, it can break God's heart. Why? Why did God uh, uh, reverse his words on Eli? Eli will call his children, my children. Why are you people defiling God's temple? Why? That is how he was correcting his children. That was how he was correcting his children. And God said, you refuse to restrain your children. He knows what to do. He could have removed them. If he had gone to the temple and announced that these children were no longer, they are no longer the priests in this temple. If he had gone to make that kind of declaration in anger, so by the word of the Lord, I, if, I am still, if I am still your high priest, I decree that from today, these two children of mine, they will no longer be priests in this temple. The next time they come to the temple, you know, Israelites are very violent. The next time they see them in the temple, they will just stone them to death. But the father failed to exercise his lawful anger on his own children. So he spared the rod, spoiled his children. Today is true that there are parents today who fail to discipline their children. They fail to exercise a godly anger against their own children. You see, in discipline ravaging your child, you are too sentimental because that is not love. You are too sentimental, too ungodly to possess the anger of God and discipline that child. Especially when the child is young. The best time, the best time, the best time to discipline your child. And hey, you know, we think the Bible it was written for archaic people. The Bible says madness is, is bound, is <laughs> bound in the heart of a child. He said it is the rod that will drive it out. And when the Bible says rod, it doesn't actually mean cane or beating or flogging or stick. I, I know a parent that uses stones and sharp up there to beat the children. That's not what we are saying. No? But that you will not be taught discipline. That says the son, the father loves, he chastises it. It is a measure of love to exert a form of anger to, to get exact change in the life of your child. There are pastors who will fail to discipline people in their church. Paul was angry with the Corinthian church. Put out this level from among you. Don't you know that a little level levels the whole long? How will somebody be among you who is sleeping with, with the wife of his own father? And none of you are keeping quiet. And the guy, over to the devil. <laughs> what are you saying? And the guy, over to the devil. 
for the destruction of his flesh, so that his soul will be preserved. How many of you hand over your children over to the devil once in a while? It's needed. Now, don't mean it literally. Okay? Hallelujah. I, I hope I've cleared that. <laughs> that says, flog him, it will not kill him. And there are ways, like I said, there are ways to discipline a child without flogging him. Some of you, you want to be you want to be civilized. You want to be civilized. And then you raise an homosexual. Oh, I just don't want to force him. I want him to be whatever he wants. Is that what the Bible says? And then you raise the lesbian. I just want to be civilized. I don't want to force him. Then you raise an atheist. I want to be civilized. Continue. Continue. You will answer to God. God gave you a tabula result of a child, a child who knows nothing. You, 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 you are unable to make that child. The Bible says, train up your child in the way you should go. When he's old, you will not depart from it. You, you said, I, I, I just want to be civilized. A man that has a very strong impact on me is an American. And he said, before your child knows that they can call the police on you for flogging, that is when you flog the child. American, spark the child. Before the child knows, by the time the child you know that you can actually call the, the police on your parents, by then it doesn't need to be flogged anymore. And by that time, he has learned the fear of his parents already. And that fear is going away. Don't be civilized. See, see children, beat your, your, hi. Oh dear Lord. Your child, you will spank your child. Your child will spank you back. If you still have a child doing that, please go and stop it. Children are the easiest to tame. Easiest. Only if you can learn to stand your ground. When they are that, that young age, between ages 0 to 5, very key, you must instill that fear in them. You shouldn't be flogging your child at 10, 11, 12. It's already getting out of hand. And even if you have to flog a child at 12, by, by, by 13, you shouldn't be flogging a child anymore. But ideally, if you do your work well by age 7 or 9, 7, you shouldn't be beating your child anymore. By then, you can discipline them with other things. Because by that time, now you need to flog them more than before you paint them. Meanwhile, there's a time when a single tap like this will make them cry. That it will, it will even be the pain of the king that made them cry. But the fact that they know that you discipline them, just a single tap, you make them cry. You make them know that I've done something wrong. And some child don't even need to be flogged. Just a simple stop that. Stan Frank, stop that. You make them cry. You pain them and know that I've done what is wrong. There are other ways to discipline a child. Face the wall. Sit down there. Go into that room. Go to your bed. No games. No TV. No phones. There are different ways to discipline a child. But to refuse to discipline, uh, you will answer to God. Remember. Remember. That when children don't turn right, God blames their parents. I have said this again and again, and, and I'm a parent too, and I understand the responsibility of being a parent. That every time children don't turn well in the Bible, God, without fail, has blamed the parents. Today, par people are saying it is the child. It is the child. I trained him, but he just wanted to misbehave. No, the Bible did not believe in that. Now, the rod is not only the thing to raise a child. The Bible says it is the rod and the staff that brings comfort. So there must be a rod, there must be a staff. So some of you who also over beat your children. And of, of course I'm coming there. Because I'm talking about, now I'm talking about the legitimate, the God's righteous anger that you must display. You see, you, are not, you must never be angry with a child. The anger must always be against the evil work of the devil. Never. Never. 
I, I, I make it a personal discipline to never rebook my children for a mistake they, they make against me in person. If they hit me by mistake or did something that hurts me. No. As far as it is me behind the scene. No, no, no. no. Leave this pray for that. But when it is clear that whatever it is they are doing is insidious to their own self and to their own training, that is when this people must be meted out. Meet, meet out. Hallelujah. And it's not only this. There are several other areas. I've talked about a church, a, a, a pastor rebooking their children. I've talked about a leader rebooking people under you. People, some people have also become so... What's the word now? What's the word? They, you know, they become... They don't care. People will be going, doing wrong things under you. People will be misbehaving under your leadership. And you just, just let's just leave them. He will answer to God. Be angry and say not. Don't allow the sun to set on your anger as long as the work of the devil is still in that place. Don't allow the sun to set on your anger. I don't know if you're afraid about the story of Martin Luther King Jr. Go and try and read. That man is a man of God. He was a man of God. I hope you know that the battle he fought was a righteous fight. I hope you know that he prophesied his own death before he even died. He said, God already showed him that he's going to die. Because he saw an injustice on his streets. And he prayed and God showed him that one day things will go wrong. Things will get better. But there must be a fight. There must be a sacrifice. And he was willing to give himself to it. Even while he was being begged and pleaded with not to do it. He said, no. And he stood his ground against injustice. Sadly, many things he fought for today has been, you know, thrown into the, into the dustbin. But then, the things he saw to happen, the freedom he, he, he saw in the future, he battered it because he failed. He, he refused. He refused. He refused to allow the sun to set on his anger. Injustice on our streets, injustice in different places, work of the devil, evil, being praised, being exalted, and then people who are God's children keep quiet and say, let's just be quiet. Let's just be praying. No. We have a duty under God to be angry against the work of the devil. Anger was never meant to be used against people. It is always against the devil. I hope you know that God gets angry, and God's anger is not sinful. I always boast about how angry God gets. God gets. If you think that you, I'll tell people, anybody that thinks he knows how to get angry should go and sit down and find out how God gets angry. Hallelujah. There is a time called the Great Tribulation, and it is just a tip of the iceberg to explain that God is angry. And I went to see that God is angry, so look at what was done to Jesus on the cross. Because it was the anger of God that was meted on his body. The, the anger God has towards sin was demonstrated in the body of Jesus. The Bible says in Isaiah 53 that his visage was so mad that we could no longer tell if he was a human being. And once again, when you want to know how angry God is. The Bible says, a fire was kindled in my anger and it burned to the lowest hell. Hell fire is the anger of God in manifest. A fire that burns forever. You see, this anger is not a selfish anger. So be ye angry and sin not. I challenge you to get angry with the works of the devil in your life. I challenge you to get angry with anger, with the, 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 the rot of man, your, your fleet of anger that just bursts anytime. I challenge you to get angry with this. I challenge you to get angry with every uh, little focus in your life that is destroying the vine. Get angry. You are too convenient with it. I challenge you to get angry with prayerlessness. I challenge you to get angry with lukewarmness. Be angry 
Don't allow the sun to set on your anger. Until you see that Satan moves, you don't move. I challenge you to wrestle to the breaking of the day. Until the power of sin is broken in your life. I challenge you to stand your ground until sickness leaves your life. Don't go getting angry with people. Somebody cuts you in traffic. Somebody hits your car. You are now screaming, ordinary car. Meanwhile, the devil is sitting on your head as migraine, sitting on your stomach as cancer. You are not angry with that one. Somebody back your car, you are now displaying yourself. Speaking of Jesus, the Bible says his voice was never heard on the street. It will never break a, 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 a shaking reed, it will never break. Meaning that you never see him fighting anybody. No, 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 no. But when he saw the devil at work in the temple of his father, oh, sweet, sweet, sweet Savior. Oh, gentle, gentle Jesus. Oh, sweet, sweet, peaceful and gentle Jesus was not peaceful and gentle that day. The Bible says he, he took his time. You saw them, you didn't see anything. <laughs> you guys, oh, no, no, no premonition, no, no pre-notice. First of all, he didn't even say anything. He didn't want them, no warning. He went to a corner, found a rope. Instead of him to use the rope like, no, he twisted it. Twisted it very well. Look at it, oh, correct. This one will pay body. <laughs> Enter, saw a guy, still trying to pick one, one door on the ground. Whack out, the guy is back. Flog everybody out. When they saw the way he was angry, they, nobody, they didn't need to ask who he was. They knew that this guy must have a right in this place to do what he has done. People doing businesses, turn away their business, pour their money away. You think he was just saying, please excuse me, can I, can I pour this thing away? Please put back. Excuse me, sir. Let me just pour it away. Please, sir, give me the key. I want to open this. I want to send the doves. Okay. Was the anger of the Lord against wickedness. When he saw people buying and selling the temple of his father, some of you, like I said, there are things selling and buying in your body that you need to get angry with. Sicknesses in your body. The doctor looks at you and says, This is so soon happening to you, refuse to get angry. You carry the paper and you are crying. <laughs> no, 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 no. No. That's not we respond to the work of the devil. It's not a personal thing. But I am the temple of the Lord. And sickness cannot stay here. Get angry. Get angry. Get angry. Be angry. But don't sin. Don't allow the sun to go down on your anger. Every time you see the devil at work, get angry. Wherever it is, in your house, in your church, in your body, in your life, in your Christian life, get angry. Get angry. Again, Jesus got angry again uh, with Peter. Jesus said, I'm the Son of Man is going to the, to the cross, he's going to die, he's going to be humiliated, he's going to be this. Peter said, <clears throat> Bible says, Peter took him aside. And began to rebook him and said, No, 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 it will not come to you, it's not come to pass in your life. Eh? You mean for the, the purpose for which I was sent, you are telling me that I will not fulfill my destiny. Even though you were saying it out of your concern for me, get ye behind me, Satan. Today, you refuse, you cease to be Peter. As far as the context of this discussion is concerned. You are not a Satan. Get deep behind me, Satan, for you save all the things that are not of God, but of men. On that day, it wasn't gentle. As I'm preaching, I'm preaching to myself. When people are marketing sin to you, you are, they are, they are, they are smiling. You are being nice. You are being Mr. Nice. No. Get angry. Get angry. Every time you see the devil at work around you, you get angry. The Bible says you resist the devil. You know what it means to resist? To resist. You don't resist gently. You don't resist playing in a playing way. You resist violently. 
Hallelujah. And it's not you go and carry cutlass and uh, you know that is not how. Hey, you know I've, I've said this here before that the only the, the way you rebook the devil is first of all to understand that you are empowered to be above him. It is only somebody who is Bible says rebook not an elder and treat him as a father. You have no right to rebook somebody that is higher than you. So for you to rebook the devil, you must first of all understand that you are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Far above principalities and powers. When you know you are the senior and he's the junior, when you not see a junior person misbehaving around your corner, then you know that I have the right under God to pass a rebuke. I say, Mr. Man, get out. Now, when you say that, you can say, Mr. Man, get out. And uh, you are saying it from a place of fear. You are saying it from a place of ignorance. But when you are saying it from the place of knowledge, when you are seated where you are meant to sit, and you just say, tell the devil, Mr. Man, get out. We bow and leave. Because he knows who is talking to him. So it's not by screaming or by shouting or by jumping. Or by, of course, if it's needed to show your anger, go ahead. Now, what anger is wrong? I've told you the right anger. So I've explained to you what Ephesians 26 is, 4.26 is saying. That get angry. Eh? God's children, what should you do? Get angry. Get angry. Do not allow the sun to go down until Satan moves. As long as Satan still has a place in your life. As long as Satan still has a place in your business, it's, if he has a place in your body, the Bible says, don't allow the sun to set. Don't allow it to set. So Satan is always looking for a place, a place to stay. Always. Always. Let it not be that if you find space in your body, you find find place in your body. In Revelation 12, the Bible says, Satan was cast down. There was no longer a place found for him. So when it comes down to earth, he's looking for a place, a place, a place in your body, a place in your home, a place in your marriage, a place in your children. What will you do? You have to rebel like the angels rebelled against him and fought against him. The Bible says, in the angels fought. The dragon fought. You were not smiling to him and smiling at Satan. Will you go? We don't want you here. The Bible says they fought. Hallelujah. So you see, what kind of anger is? The Bible says, ask us to put away. Now, every other form of anger apart from this one is wrong. So by implication, every time, every time, every time you get angry with your brother, you are wrong. If, you know, the Bible says, you know, let's go back to Matthew 5. He said, when you get angry with your brother without a cause, so the only cause that permits you to get angry with your brother is a righteous cause. Because you are not rebuking him or getting angry with him because of anything that has to do with self. It's not about me. So how can you determine if my anger is godly or not? It's simple. If Every time you are angry, ask the question, why am I angry? Now, one of the, the kind of, the righteous anger of God comes from two sources. Number one source is it comes from your spirit. This anger comes, there is an anger that comes from your spirit. That is, I can't explain it, but you will know it from your spirit. And of course, the evidence is that it's not against a human being. It is usually against the devil. Now, sometimes when it is against the devil, some people may be keeping that devil. So they may accidentally, while you are trying to get at the devil, you may eventually get at them. <laughs> you get that. Spiritual Sword said that uh, they always ask me, you know, when Spiritual Sword is doing, uh, is performing his miracles and healing people, he usually hits people. You know, we kick people 
and punch people when doing his own. Uh, that's how he go and go and read. It. That's how he does his own miracles. So if you ask, if you tell him, uh, 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 Pastor Smith, I have a pain in my stomach, you just punch the stomach, and then you'll be healed. Pastor, uh, I can't see. Punch your eyes, and you see. That was what we heard about the way he does his healing. So somebody, I, I, th- I think I heard a particular story where he was preaching, and then he saw somebody on top of the podium. You know, it's this like a stadium form. The guy was on a wheelchair and on top. So he told the guy, Mr. Man in a wheelchair, a social place, I command you right now, rise up and walk. The guy didn't answer. Mr. Man in social place, I command you, rise up and walk. The guy didn't answer. You know what he did? He went to him, pushed him down. <laughs> he pushed the guy down. The guy rolled and landed on the ground and then jumped up and began to walk. Hallelujah. So that was into So one day they asked him, all right, this is why I'm saying the story. So they asked him, why are you always getting angry? He said, he said, don't, don't blame me. He said, I am angry. It is the devil I'm angry with. He said, the problem is people's bodies, they get in the way with my anger with the devil. He said, it's, Satan is the one I, I'm angry with, not them, but you know, their bodies is standing between them and the devil. So sorry, when I try to eat the devil, they will, they will you know. They will bear the brunt too. Hallelujah. So there's a kind of anger that comes from the spirit. I remember sometimes ago, my elder brother, I think he went to do something for me or something like that. And then um, I think he lost his phone while trying to help me fix something for me. And usually, um, sometimes this spiritual anger, which is born of the spirit, can also go with a supernatural faith. So it, it can work like that. You can be angry like in your spirit, and then it can give out to supernatural faith. It's, these are things that, these are the workings of God that, you know, I cannot go on to explain now because that is not our focus. So when I heard that immediately, I, I got angry in my spirit and the response was the spirit of faith. And I said, you are going to find the phone. You know, he traveled, forgot the phone uh, in a very, he didn't even know where he, he just knew that he got to where he was going and the phone was not with him. This was when the phone was not wrong. You know, it was a serious business. And um, when he told me, I just decreed the name of Jesus that the phone will be found. And, you know, cut those holy shots. So I think somebody found the phone, charged the phone was even dead, charged the phone, tried to reach him and ensure the phone go back. So sometimes this anger can, can be manifested, um, can come up with, can come with, um, with the spirit of faith. All right, <clears throat> the spiritual anger. Uh, so this kind of anger, of course, the way you will know is that it is not selfish. It is totally, totally against the devil and against his work. And if persons have decided to cohabit with the devil to be the source, then sometimes they may bear the brunt. But you remember that it is never against the people. It means you never hate the people. You never dis- if so, even if somebody is behind the scene. Even if the devil is behind the scene, even if you know that this person is the devil that wants to kill me, and you know that it is sponsored by the devil, you can hate the devil behind him, but you can never hate him. Because anybody who hates his brother is a murderer. They can't hate. They can't hate. Hallelujah. So that is how you know that it is of the Spirit. Now the second one is when you use anger as a weapon. When you use anger as a tool and not, uh, anger is not controlling you. Now, there are situations where you are not angry. There is no emotional anger inside of you. But because you saw something wrong, you had to stir up your anger so that you can use that as a tool to correct that situation. And that's a righteous anger too. When you can stir up an anger by yourself. So this is not like I am angry. Uh, no, 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 no. But you can pick that anger up as a tool and use that anger to deal with the matter. And then when you are done, you can pocket it back and continue business as usual like nothing happened because you are now the master of that anger. You use it as a tool. And parents need this kind of anger on their children. Now, anytime you get angry with your child, 
and the anger is welling up inside you, if you are not careful, you will be the child and kill the child. Never beat your child in anger. Never. Don't do it. Except that anger is used as a drama. In this, this now, this one is like you're using anger as a drama. You are dramatizing that, that anger. Like I am using this anger, I am wearing this blanket of anger for this moment, for this attitude. I am changing my face, I am strengthening my voice, I am, you know, um, showing that I'm angry with this thing. Meanwhile, I am not really angry. I mean, I am this is an emotional, selfish anger. So when I'm done using that tool, I can pocket it back, and then things can go as usual. So these are the two ways through the righteous anger can be manifested. And if you fail to use this anger when you need it, I mean, your child can do something wrong and it doesn't get you angry. But then you know that if I don't show this child that this is wrong and show that it is very wrong and dangerous and make all the face and make all the grimness of the face to show that I am angry, he may never know that it is wrong and he may never learn. So I will pick up anger as a tool and use it to show and then put it back. But see, the kind of anger that comes on you and you begin to misbehave, you do more than you are meant to do, you flog than you are meant to flog, you beat than you are meant to beat, that's not righteous. Usually parents go to punching their children, slapping, beating, you know, doing all kind of things. No, it's wrong. If you cannot pick up a very small, tiny cane and say, bring your hand, let me flog you, and you people just slap their child on the back. Even slapping your child is wrong on the face. It's wrong. If they have done something wrong, pick a small cane, pick their hand, and just tap it. Let them know that what you have done is wrong. Hallelujah. So every form of anger that comes because of something done against you. See how you burnt the food. Don't you know that things are expensive? See how you broke the plate. Don't you know that plates are this and that? It is always about you. See what he said to me. See how he treated me. See what everything is about me. Families are splitting because of me. All the anger is because of me. So, the only cause that God permits for you to get angry with your neighbor will be on a cause that is 100% spiritual, 100% godly. Because the Bible says, the wrath of man never works the righteousness of God. So the only wrath permitted is the wrath of God. And the wrath of God is necessary. So the only kind of wrath permitted is the wrath of God that you must be able to display when there is need. I understand that Eli is not probably not angry with his children for what they are doing. But he needed to put on an angry face so that the child will know. He needed to show that I am angry. That's what is needed. If you read the letter of Paul to the Corinthians, you know that he was showing anger when he was writing it. Oh, you foolish Galatians who has bewitched you. How do you know what that? <laughs> yeah. Those are strong words. It means you guys are bewitched. You are enchanted. You have, you have, what happened to you? Where did your brain go? Anger, because he was rebooking a very bad precedence among them. Hallelujah. So every time you are angry and the purpose of your anger is totally selfish, it's about what was done against me, that anger is not righteous, and let the, when you get angry like that, you need to go and repent. Don't go and say that, of course, uh, I'm allowed to get angry. Mm, but uh, as, as long as I said to it, no, 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 no. If you, begin to ha- if you begin to change this mindset, over time, you can get to a place where it becomes so difficult to get you angry. So difficult. And the more difficult it becomes, the farther the way it is to get you angry. And you can get to a place where you no longer get angry anymore. You know, it's one thing to be angry, it's one thing to be offended, it's one thing to be sad, all these things have their places, it's one thing to be pained. But anger is what we're talking about now. You can get to a place where you don't get angry. People will do things that should make you angry and you'll be angry. And one of the ways 
you'll be closing now. We'll continue from there next week. Hallelujah. One of the ways that you can deal with your anger is to lay down your world before God on the altar. Lay down your ego on the altar. Some of you need to go and surrender your life to Jesus. Surrender all that you have. Why do people get angry today? Mostly about what is done against them, about against their ego, against their person, against their properties. But if you can lay them all before Jesus and go and declare in prayers. I've, I've given you one prayer point before. I'm giving you another one now. That Lord, it does not matter what people do against me, I will not be angry. You need to go and confess that at the altar of Jesus in prayers. I said, even if my wife will slap me, I won't be angry. Even if she insults me, I won't be angry. Even if people do this to me, I won't be angry. Even if my subordinate will do this, I won't be angry. When you go and confess this in prayers, then you'll be empowered because you begin to have what you say. Even if somebody batches my car, I will not be angry. Even if somebody do this to me, every think about the things you 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 esteem the most in your life, then tell yourself. Even if it is done against me, I will not be angry. In prayers, in prayers, in prayers. The more you say it, the more you are changed. The more you confess the reality of who you are in Christ Jesus, the more you are changed. As you behold in a glass, the glory of the Lord, we are transformed from the same image from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. That's how to do it. That's how to do it. Then you can we get to that place where indeed people will do things that we expect that you'll be angry, but you'll not be angry. You won't be angry. You will not be angry you are changed. You are like Jesus. You are like Jesus. He had the power. They blocked him. They won't allow him to allow him to pass. And his disciples, they were angry for him. They were angry for him. They said, Let us call down fire. He said, no, 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 we don't do that. We don't call down fire on people. We are not here to destroy people's lives. We are here to save them. He said, no, 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 let's not forget. Let's go and pass away. It's going to take us a longer time. It's going to take us more stress. But then, something to be angry about. Eventually, all things will work together for our good. I was speaking in church I think two or three weeks ago. Two weeks ago now, I believe. Two weeks ago. And, um, you know, they, they were talking about how difficult it is to forgive people that hurt you. And I told them, as a child of God, if you understand that all things, if you believe that scripture, Romans 8.28, that all things work together for your good and you will find it easy to forgive anybody. Because if you read about two or three verses after, he said, who, who can, he said, God, because God is for us, who can be against us? So, as a child of God, there is nothing anybody can actually do against you. Because everything they do against you is a tool in God's hand to make it work together for your good. I am equipping you now with the knowledge you need to live above anger. Number one, you have surrendered all, all you are and all you have to, to God. All you are, not you have. You have told yourself, I am nobody. Who am I that they are insulting? I am dead. If I'm, if, is it not because I heard they insulted you? That's why I'm angry. Is it not because I heard that somebody or I saw? What if I was blind? God gave me eyes. What if I could not hear? What if I was dead? I've never seen a dead man retaliating or getting angry. So you must go to the place and go and die there and say, Lord, I am dead. I'm a dead man. One small boy was insulting me. I'm, don't you know who I am, Mr. Man? Who are you? Somebody insulted you and caused you poor because he doesn't know how much is in my account. How, how much do you have? Who are you? What if you are dead? What if you are dead? So you must go to God's presence and lay down all, everything you have, everything you are, lay down on the altar. And then you will have reduced your tendency of getting angry by almost 50%. The other 50% is that you come to a place where you understand that if God be for us, nobody can be against us. If you believe that scripture with all your heart, then you know that nobody can hurt you. Nobody can hurt you. Nobody can actually hurt you. If they insult you, you will use it to grow in Christ. If they bless you, you use it to grow in Christ. If they steal from you, you use it to grow in Christ. All 
all things work together for good for them who love the Lord and for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he did predestined, he also called to be conformed to the image of his son. No matter what people do against you, it is part of your training process to become more like Jesus. Begin to pray. But I just begin to pray. Begin to pray now. Begin to pray now. Begin to pray now. Can you begin to lay down at the altar? Lay down that your ego. You respect yourself so much. You care so much about the money you have. You care so much about your respect in your community. You care so much about your age. Your age. Your age means so much to you. I am older than him. How can that? Some of you, you are angry with people. You have failed to forgive somebody because you have failed to go and make peace with somebody because you felt I am, I am the older one. It's meant to come to me. Ah, yeah. The Bible says, put away all bitterness, put away all wrath, put away all clamor, put away all malice, put away all anger, put away all wrath. I begin to say, Lord Jesus, I, I lay down. Can you begin to put down your crowns and lay down now? The Bible says the, the, the elders, the 24 elders, they lay down their, when they see the holiness of God, they lay down their crowns. They say we are nobody. Even though you, there's a crown on our head. No, no, no. When we see your holiness, we know that this crown is not fitting for our heads. It is fitting for the floor before your holy presence. Can you begin to lay down everything you have? Lay down your money. Everything that makes you proud, that makes you proud, lay it down. Time fails us today to talk about how that every contention comes from pride. The Bible says, by pride comes all contention. Comes all contention. Everything you have and everything you are, there are reasons why you get angry. There are reasons why you contend with your neighbor. I need to lay it down now. Lay it down. Lay down all that you have. See, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If you are an insult, it doesn't matter. They spat on Jesus. They dragged him on the floor. The king of kings, they dragged him on the floor. It doesn't matter what they do to me. It doesn't matter whether I'm insulted or I am called names. It doesn't matter whether, what any man do against me. It does not matter. I am a nobody. I am a nobody. Only Jesus has made me somebody. I am nothing. I am nothing without Jesus. I am nothing without him. But I am everything in him. It does not matter what anybody do to me or say to me or say about me. I refuse to be angry. I choose to love. I choose to love. It does not matter. In the name of Jesus. It will not matter. In the name of Jesus. I'm going to decree now. I'm going to say, Lord, I know. Lord, I know. Lord, I know that there is nobody who can hurt me. No matter what they do against me. No matter what they do to me. I know that in your master plan, it is working together for my good. No matter what they do against me. No matter what I go through. No matter what men think they are doing to me. It is working out for my good. It is making me more like Christ. There is nothing in this world that we hold on to. No matter what is done against me, it is working out for my good. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your name. I'm going to ask the Lord to grant you the grace to get angry. In some of you, you are too passive. You are too cold. And you allow the devil to ride on you. I'm going to say now, Lord, the lion of the tribe of Judah is in me. I learned to roar. I learn to roar. When I see a careless goat moving around my, 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 my vicinity, when I see a careless insect trying to invade my privacy, I learn to roar. The lion of the tribe of Judah dwells in me. I am not, though I am, the, I, 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 I am a lamb of God, yet I am the lion of the tribe of Judah. He lives through me. He walks through me. Yes, I can be quiet like a dove. I may be quiet like a dove. Notwithstanding, the lion of the tribe of Judah dwells in me. And I roar against the devil, against all his works. I roar. When the lion roars in the jungle, everything that is in that area, everything that is in that territory, that is not meant to be, to be there, they leave. So in the name of Jesus, I refuse to be a sleeping lion. I refuse to be a sleeping sheep. I roar from my territory. And everything in my life, in my workplace, in my children that does not represent Jesus, I refuse to smile to them. I roar. I refuse to smile. I roar. I get angry in my spirit. I get angry until Satan moves. I refuse to move. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Father, we thank you. We bless you. 
We bless you. We bless you. Thank you for your word that has come to us. I pray for every, everyone under the sound of my voice who is plagued by the devil. Somebody is, you have a condition in your heart. I, I decree in the name of Jesus. That condition is declared healed in the name of Jesus. That spirit sponsoring that heart condition. Get out of that body in the name of Jesus. You don't belong there. Get out in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Everyone with migraine, 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 pain in the head, I decree that that evil spirit that is tormenting your head, it leaves never to return. In the name of Jesus, everyone with a pain in a pain in the hand, a pain in the hand, I decree you are healed in the name of Jesus. Pain in the navel, healed in the name of Jesus. Every work of devil in your life, I decree by the virtue of your presence today in this meeting, the devil loses his hold on your life in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. Amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to Jesus. I believe you've been blessed by that teaching. Uh, we are still looking at Matthew chapter 5. And uh, God willing, next week we'll talk about some other things uh, in that same verse. And I pray that God will bless you and continue to bless us all tremendously in the name of Jesus. Don't forget to share this teaching with somebody. Be a blessing to your life. And uh, when God blesses them, of course, the heavens will also thank you for sharing with them. God bless you. And have a wonderful, wonderful weekend ahead. Shalom. Glory to Jesus. We believe you are blessed by that powerful teaching. You can find this teaching and other SGS teachings on our YouTube channel. Please do well to subscribe, like, and turn on the notification bell in order to receive updates about our teachings subsequently. You can also find the compressed audio version of this teaching and other SGS teachings on our website and Telegram platform. Do well to drop your questions and comments immediately after the broadcast. You can also join us every Wednesdays and Fridays at 6 p.m. as we'll be learning at the feet of Jesus. Remain blessed. Shalom.